Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hoop. This is our regular weekly message. And today's message is entitled, The Lord's Favorable Grace. God wants us to enjoy His favor. He has given us opportunity to seek Him, to seek His face so that He can grace us with His unfathomable grace, His favor. Grace is often defined as the unmerited favor of God shown to unworthy men and women, which Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, that God has lavished upon us. God has lavished His grace. He has lavished His favor on everyone who, is, who has accepted His Son as Lord and Savior. See, the Lord's favor is what wakes us up in the morning, what keeps us through the day, and what lays us down at night. But best of all, it is God's favor or God's grace that has saved a wretch like me. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 23 through 25, But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, it's God's grace that has saved you. It is God's grace that has saved me. Without God's great favor, without His great grace, we will be hopeless. We would have no hope at all. But please understand that God shows His love, His grace, His favor on all people. When He lets His rain rain upon the wicked as well as the just. When he causes his son to shine on the righteous as well as the unrighteous, he shows his favor, he shows his grace to all people because God is a good, good father. He's a good, good God. Turn with me, please, to Psalms chapter 5, verse 12. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. See, our God, as I said, is a good, good God. And His love endures forever. There's no good thing that God will willfully withhold from us, His children. He has created us for His good pleasure in order that He might bless us, that He might commune with us, and cause His great favor to rest upon each one of us. There is, is no God like our God. There is no rock like our rock. For our God reigns and rules over all. And there is nothing that is outside of His control. All things move and happen according to His own good pleasure and His own good will. Remember Joseph? Joseph was a man loved by God. He was blessed and highly favored. But still, he was hated by his own brothers who sold him into slavery. Someone will ask, how can that be favor? Being sold into slavery by your own brothers? Your brothers who hate you? Is that really favor? Not only that, but Joseph was falsely accused of attempted rape and thrown into prison. Is that really favor? Favor, as defined in Webster's New World Dictionary, means friendly or kind regard, goodwill, approval, like it. It does not mean that you will spend your life wallowing in the lap of luxury and sleeping on a bad bed of roses. The favor and grace of God comes with a price. Look at Mark chapter 10, verse 29 through 31. Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel 
who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. There is a price to pay, but the reward, the reward is way, way greater. The reward is eternal life without all of the cares and the worries of this world that we know today. Never again will we be persecuted. Never again will we know hunger. Never again will we be, be thirsty. Never again will we be scared. Never again will we be worried. Never again will we be concerned over things. No more tears. No more sad goodbyes. Because there will be no more death. There will be no more lies. There will be no more murders or cheating. There will be eternal peace and eternal joy of the Lord. As the scripture said, everyone who had the favor of God rest upon them paid a price before entering into the promise, that promised blessing. Abraham was 100 years old before he saw the birth of his promised son. Isaac. Although Jacob was the apple of God's eye, he still went through a whole lot of stuff. Joseph was sold into slavery and falsely accused and thrown into prison before he saw his promise. David was hunted by King Saul, who tried to kill him several times. He spent several years hiding in caves and in strongholds, running from King Saul before he was able to live in the, past, in, the, in the palace and rule the kingdom of Israel. We're called to be obedience, not comfort. The lie of the devil is, God wants me happy, as if that is God's main priority. Some people think that God will move heaven and earth to ensure their comfort, to ensure their happiness. If not, then they don't have the favor of God resting upon them. What we Christians do is we measure our things or our situation in life, our abundance with those of people around us, as if we seem to not measure up when, we don't, when our things don't measure up to their abundance. Then we're convinced that we're not enjoying the favor of God. Just before Jesus' ascension, he asked Peter three times if he loved him. Peter replied, yes, Lord, I love you. Every time Peter would say, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Then Jesus told him, feed my sheep. No one is called to be idle. We all have work to do, and that work is feeding Jesus is sheep. You don't have to be a full-time lead pastor in order to feed sheep. We just need to be knowledgeable ourselves. We just need to be committed. We just need to be willing vessels to share our testimony. Tell someone about the love of Jesus, what he has done for me, what he has done for you. Then Jesus goes on to tell Peter how he would die. Peter did not seem to be intrigued with that. He did not seem to be pleased with what he learned about his future. He apparently turns away from the conversation because the scripture says that he turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. He points his finger at him and he says this to Jesus. John chapter 21, verse 21 and 22. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. See, your job is not based on somebody else's job. Your call is not based on somebody else's call. Your experience is not their experience. Your situation is not their situation. Your job is to follow Jesus and be obedient to his plan for you. 
When things get hard and persecution gets rough, always remember, you are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, the life that you live do not belong to you. It belongs to Jesus who purchased you. You will receive your life in eternity. This life here on earth is only for a short time, and it is in preparation for eternity. It is to be lived for Jesus. That is not too much to ask, since it was Jesus who purchased you by giving his own life on Calvary. Did you notice what Jesus said to Peter in, in verse 22? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So don't look around and notice the lush lifestyle of someone else. That the lush lifestyle that they might be living or seem to be living compared to your lifestyle. What is that to you? If Jesus wants to bless them, if Jesus wants to prosper them extravagantly, what is that to you? You follow Jesus. See, Jesus, when he was in his earthly ministry, was a man who enjoyed the favor of God because the grace of God was upon him. But I want us to take a look at how he is described in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1 through 4. This is Jesus being described. Who hath believed a report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That does not sound like the lap of luxury to me. Matter of fact, it sounds downright difficult and unpleasant. Someone will ask, was all of that necessary? Did Jesus really have to go through that? If so, why was it necessary for Jesus to suffer like that? Well, let us take a look at the next two verses. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There is no other way. There was no other way. And there will not be no other way. But this way, that Jesus would come and have to shed his own blood, give his own life, the innocent for the guilty. Because we, all like sheep, went astray. Each one of us turned to our own way. We started looking out for our own affairs. We were not concerned about God or the things of God. We had no idea about God until God revealed himself to us. Therefore, there was no more hope for us unless the Father laid all of our sins and all of our iniquities on him, upon his Son, Jesus Christ. See, Jesus bore the punishment for our sins, that punishment that should have been ours for all of our sins, all of our iniquities, with the blows that he took and with the nails that pierced his hands and his feet. He, he, he suffered all of that for us. That was our due. That was our punishment. Yet the Father saw it as joy to lay that upon his son Jesus. He suffered the punishment that brought us peace by bringing us back into right standing with God the Father and with he himself. Then to top it all off, Jesus was whipped with a terrible beating on his back 
that purchased our healing. By his stripes, we are healed. We don't have to live in sickness. We don't have to live in, 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 in pain and discomfort. Our healing was purchased by Jesus himself. Look at what, what he suffered on our behalf. Isaiah 53, verse 7 through 12. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before sharers is dumb, or in other words, is silent. He openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. To be cut off or to cut out of the land of the living means that Jesus suffered literal death. Jesus did not look like he was dead. He was dead. He was dead for three days and three nights before being resurrected on the third day. Let us read the last four verses, starting at verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. These are our iniquities that Jesus, the righteous, is barren. It was not his to bear it's ours, but yet Jesus bore it all. Therefore, verse 12 says, therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That is true favor. That is true favor that God, the living creator God, would leave his throne on high and come and suffer such a violent death in order to give us a blessed and highly favored eternity. He was creator God. He could have just wiped us all out and just started all over again. But his love, his compassion is so great for us that he chose to suffer that whomsoever will, whoever believes in him, should not perish but have eternal life. All you got to do is to come to Jesus and Jesus will forgive you. For no one who comes to him will he turn away. That, that my friend, is true, true, true favor. We're not talking about 70 or 80 years. We're not even talking about a 120 year lifespan. We're talking about eternity. You know what the song says? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. After 10,000 years, time has not even begun to tick yet in eternity. That, my friends, is true favor. You can't buy it with gold. You can't purchase it with silver. You can't borrow it. You can't steal it. You can't even find it. You must receive it. And then only from Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. There is no other way. There is no other name given under heaven that a man should be saved except the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God. My friends, eternity is a long, long time. Are you preparing for eternity? 
Are you living your life as a sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God? Are you preparing to meet the judge of all the world? One day, each one of us will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will be judged on what we've done. Whether we have accepted his forgiveness in this life. By then, it's going to be too late. Now is your opportunity. Now is your loved one opportunity. Do you have a son? Do you have a daughter? Do you have a spouse that is not serving Jesus? One of Jesus' first messages that he preached was this one. Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was upon him and that the Father, God the Father, had anointed him to preach good news, the good news of salvation, to release captives and to heal the sick, to bring freedom to the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Seems to me that we are living in that time. We are living in the time of the Lord's favor. It is now, it is today. Here's what John said about Jesus and favor. John chapter 1 verse 16 through 17. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That word, that word grace upon grace is the same Greek word translated favor. So the verse could have very well been translated favor upon favor. Because of the fullness of Jesus or the completeness of Jesus, we have received favor upon favor. We have received grace upon grace to the point where we can do all things through Christ who gives us his favor, who gives us his grace. In other words, his completeness or his fullness, which is his strength, becomes our strength. His fullness becomes our fullness. His righteousness is accredited to us as our righteousness. And we are made complete in Him as long as we are in Him and He is in us. Nothing is impossible for us when we are in that type of a situation because there is no lack in Jesus. There is no emptiness in Jesus. There is no absence of anything in Jesus. Nothing that is good is absent from Him. There is no barrenness of any kind in Jesus. Jesus is the fullness of God made complete through his obedience as a man. Obedience even unto death. That fullness or that completeness is given or granted to us by Jesus when he said, Lo, I am with you always. That was not just for the first century church, my friends, but that was for us as well. Because the promise is, yes, for them, sure. But it is for us as well. Look at what Peter said in his first, his first sermon message after the baptism of the Holy Spirit that morning on the day of Pentecost. He said in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, For the promise is for you, speaking to those people that was gathered, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. That is us. Everyone whom the Lord or God calls to him. Therefore, the promise of his grace, the promise of his favor is for them, but it's also for us. It is also for our children because Jesus made one sacrifice for everyone, one time, one person, Jesus Christ, the righteous for all the sinners of the world. But it comes with a responsibility. On our part. Look at Acts chapter 4 verse 33. And 
And with great power, the apostles were given their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. They were given their testimony about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And grace was upon them. And with great power, they were doing it. I want you to notice that it was not just grace, but great grace that was upon them. And not just upon the apostles, but upon them all, all of the believers. And through that grace, through that great grace, great miracles, great power, great signs, great wonders, mighty acts of healing were being performed by all the believers. All they had to do was to believe and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and believe that he could do all things through that Jesus because Jesus gave them strength to do it. His strength became their strength and they believed it and they made a, a witness to what they had heard, to what they had seen. And we must do no less. We must tell of what Jesus has done for us, how he has changed our lives. Some of us, we used to be dope smokers and, and addicts. We used to be prostitutes and, uh, and whoremongers. But we're not that anymore. We put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, all the, the believers enjoyed the grace. All the believers enjoyed the favor of the Lord. I want you to understand that grace or favor is not the same as mercy. Mercy is defined as not getting what we deserved. Grace or favor is defined as getting what we do not deserve. See, the favor of the grace of the Lord can and will open doors. It can and will heal the sick. It can and will save the lost, raise the dead, perform signs and wonders. It will perform miracles because the Lord's favorable grace that was on the first century church moved in power. Therefore, it will move in power for us as well. For without grace or without favor, there is no Holy Spirit. And thus, there is no power. It is because of this favorable grace that we can sing. Let the weak say that I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And we give thanks. Give thanks to the Father who gave his only begotten Son that we might have life. It is not by man's might, it is not by man's power, it is not by man's intellect, but by God's grace and God's favor. When we enjoy the favorable grace of the Lord, we don't need anything else. Just one drop is more than we need. Listen to this, during that six day war in 1967 between Israel and the Arab states of Egypt, Syria, and Jordan. The enemy had a superior military, with Egypt boasting the largest air force in the Middle East. And they were all allied against Israel, a fledgling state with a small, inadequate military. Apparently, Israel was so sure of defeat that they had prepared 40,000 coffins. But quite the opposite happened. God's favorable grace showed up and saved the day. Israel was able to use bombers that were just old clunkers and were so troublesome that they would always break down. But that day, the pilots flew them without any problems at all. Unbelievable. They were able to destroy 452 enemy planes while losing only 46 of their own planes. The Israeli Air Force bombed planes on airstrip after airstrip and not one person radioed ahead about the pending danger that was upon them. Not one person until all of those planes, 452 enemy planes were destroyed. A two-man Israeli infantry unit on parole reported an 
uh, an encounter that they had with a truck loaded with 18 well-armed Egyptian soldiers. The two Israelis, equipped with inadequate weapons, believed that they faced certain death. But when one of them shouted, hands up, they all put up their hands and they surrendered. When that Israeli asked that um, Egyptian sergeant, why did you not shoot us? He replied, my arms froze. They became paralyzed. My whole body was paralyzed. I don't know why. On another occasion, the Arabs waved the flag, the white flag of surrender to a far, far smaller Jewish tank. The tank commander later explained that he gave up because he saw a desert mirage that made him see hundreds of Israeli tanks. These are the sort of things that happen when God's favor, when God's grace is upon you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. No one can pluck you out of God's hands. Nothing can come against you without God giving the okay, without God letting it happen. Therefore, you are never outside of God's will. Let me ask you then, do you enjoy his favorable grace today? You can if you, if you don't. All you have to do is to ask Jesus into your life. He will come in and he will make his home with you and he will shed his favorable grace upon you, upon your family, upon your spouse, upon your children. So would you like to know Jesus as your own personal savior today? Here's how. All you have to do is to say this prayer. Mean it in your heart and you will be saved. So if you want to be saved, repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me my sins. Help me to live my life for you. Help me to live my life in faith, in obedience. And I accept your free gift of salvation. And I thank you, Jesus, for it's in your name I pray. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now what you need to do is to get a Bible, get a highlighter, read your Bible from cover to cover. Start wherever you want to start. Some say start in the book of John. That's fine. Wherever it's the word of God and God speaks through his word. Just read, just begin. When, when I first got saved, I started in Genesis, and I read all the way through to the book of Revelation. Every single word of the Bible, I read it from cover to cover. And I try to do that every year. I'm not telling you to do that. You can start in the New Testament. Just start. Just begin to read your Bible. Highlight those verses that are meaningful to you. Memorize those verses, because there's coming a time when those Bibles are going to be taken away from us. It's going to be illegal to have them. But they cannot take away what's in your heart. Memorize the Word of God. Meditate on the Word of God. Then find yourself a Bible-believing church that still believes in righteousness, still believes in holiness, still believes in the power of Almighty God. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. And when Jesus comes back, He'll find you doing what it is you should be doing. Remember to pray. Learn to pray. Learn to commune with God. And so Jesus will say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now I want to say thank you for joining us. I appreciate you all joining us every Sunday, every week, and watching our videos on, on, on the internet. And We appreciate you. Jesus loves you. He died for you. And we love you. The Lord bless you richly. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.